Omnia vasa monasteri, cumptamque substantiam axi altaris vasa sacrata conspiciat, nihil ducat negigendum. Let him regard all the utensils of the monastery and its whole property as if they were the sacred vessels of the altar. Let him not think that he may neglect anything. Perhaps it is the echo of chapter 31 in the rule of St. Benedict that may explain the special tradition of conservation in the monasteries and abbeys of the Benedictine and Cistercian order. Unlike families of the nobility, whose collections were often dominated by the spleen of individual collectors, the old abbeys show a highly involved sensibility for the relation between care and conservation throughout history. For this reason, the collections of monastic houses are preserving treasures of our cultural heritage as a part of their vivid identity. The Cistercian Abbey of Zwettl, located at the River Camp in the north of Lower Austria, may be a good example of the inner cultural processes that characterize this special form of tradition. The questions are, why have objects been preserved for a long time? In what form have they survived? We will see that it is impossible to define an original state of the different examples. The main aspects for understanding the reasons could be defined as interpretation, meaning and experience. Values that highly depend on changing ways of understanding within a continuous tradition. By 1258, the statue of a Madonna and child was imported from the Ile de France and came to Farewitzwettel. The ivory sculpture, one of a few datable examples of a similar typus, remained a religious or liturgical object until the 19th century, newly interpreted for several times. The first change that we can see was the assembly with fragments of an ivory diptych probably made in the 17th century. The former figure of one of the three holy kings was then read as Saint Louis of France, who was regarded as the donator of the Zwetlen Madonna. The loss of an architectural surrounding, like a shrine, that the figure had until that time is the strong sign of an inner change interpreting the medieval object in the sense of a baroque statue. In the 1730s, the Madonna was integrated to the altar of holy kings and empress because of its legendary origin. The artistic object was still not preserved because of its value as a piece of art, but as an indicator linked to the monastery and its history as a religious space. Not until the late 19th century, the medieval sculpture was taken out of its liturgy. Not until the 19th century, the medieval sculpture was taken out of its liturgical surrounding and exhibited in the monastery's museum. The historical meaning of the object now became stronger than the former religious importance. So how can we define this very special object? It's a Romanesque Gothic figure interpreted by means of the early Baroque as a statue with a plinth in its 19th century appreciation as an object within a museum's context. The story of an ivory crochet dating back to the 13th century shows very similar aspects. In the 18th century, the staff, already changed in the 16th and 17th century, was provided with a special wooden showcase, including a text telling the story of the object to the visitor. The crochet was regarded as gift of St. Bernard Zwettl. Doubts concerning this marvelous provenance were clearly explained in the inscription, a fact that shows the awakening conscience for historical facts. The crochet was part of the pyramid's chamber where textiles were kept in special furniture. 
written evidence can be found that this storage on the first floor was chosen because of the need for circulating fresh air. Problems with the climate seem to have evolved after one window had been closed after a case of burglary at the beginning of 20th century. The decision for a change had consequences on the original ideas of the room. Now we go to the monastery library. Throughout the centuries, Zwettel Monastery has had six libraries. The first three libraries evolved throughout the Middle Ages. They were rather small book collections kept in places that seemed convenient for one or the other reason. In the 16th century, three libraries were built from scratch. Within 60 years, what happened? Library number five, or Baroque library number two, established in 76, at least partially survived. The stuccoed ceiling is still visible, hidden in the attic. But not even 30 years after this beautifully decorated room had been finished, the books were moved again, and one would wonder why this beautiful, modern and so timely built room suddenly proved not to be good enough. It was certainly big enough to house all the books of the monastic collection. The reasons can be found in the change of the spiritual environment. Books had to serve as illustrations of the high degree of education of the convent and thus justify the monastery's existence. Therefore, the appearance of the books, the presentation aspect, was becoming increasingly important. The second Baroque library was located in the cloister, so neither the abbot nor his guests could easily access it because of the monastic rules. For the same reason, the Benedictine Abbey of Göttweig, close by, published a print showing the library and particularly the activities of the monks in the room. This print could be shown to the visitors. In Zwettel, the third Baroque library, built between 1730 and 1732, was an attempt to solve the problem in quite an extraordinary way. Secular guests were able to enter the library using a special corridor and secret doors just to access the room, whose decoration seemed surprisingly irritating within the context of a convent. Instead of sacred Christian images, it featured images of Hercules and Athena Pallas from pagan mythology. The staging of the library sought to show a room reserved to the monk's study rather than the public, with thematic fields meant to demonstrate openness to the world and the state of education within the convent. It has always been assumed that the new and third Baroque library was built due to the better climate conditions for the books. This does not match the facts, as the second and the third library are only about 50 meters apart from each other, both facing the river bank. The true reason, documented in the 1720s, was the presentational issue. Books had to be seen. Books had to be visible. The room and its decoration were not made to serve the monastic rules or users who would not have used the room in winter anyhow but to prove the importance of the education and study within the cloister and serve as a piece of evidence targeting the secular guests of the monastery. Today we find evidence of several layers of time, as we might call them, as the library was subsequently changed after 1730. Shells were added that interfere with the climate of the gallery, which is the upper part of the library, changing the air and heat flow in the room. The windows were sealed in recent time to keep insects and temperature change out, while originally all windows could be open. 
dehumidifiers were installed, creating new problems. More details will be given in the written publication. Here we only would like to stress that the proper wake-up call was a mold attack that made a close survey of the situation necessary. The new librarian, Mr. Gamaret, was less in favour of using machines for climate stabilisation and the cooperation with the conservator, who was me, led to the question whether or not the original system has ever worked as a place to preserve the books or if some sort of misplanning had happened right from the beginning. To understand that, we had to guess the original setup of the room itself, with its doors and windows, their construction and environment beyond doors and windows, which is aisles and outside, as well as the design and positioning of the shelves based on the current configuration. The mold outbreak, therefore, was not considered a call for modernizing the historical space, but as an important and reliable indicator to find out about the imbalances within the system. Survey and interviews with previous librarians helped to gradually obtain a better understanding of the situation. As a first hypothesis, we assumed that the room concept was based on some general understanding of what would help in the preservation of books. We found the windows to be critical factors and took out the recent isolation material. Now they let air pass again, which proved to be an important factor in the climate stabilization in Zwettel and an important factor to be kept in mind with respect to other libraries in the area that were built at about the same time and have worked well until today. We did not take away the shelves added in the 19th century, as they constitute part of the history of the room now, even though they influence the climate in the gallery. In particular, in a month when the sun stands low, there is a strong temperature impact there, which could be balanced again by taking out the isolation in these windows too. And Interfere as little as possible and if so, leave an explanation why you did what philosophy is possibly our key mindset. Adding another layer of conservation history to the books, an immaterial layer. At the end, we would like to thank the conference organizers and the committee for the invitation and the possibility to present our paper.